We're going to start in Isaiah 53. Yo. I was looking for a way to talk about the Easter story without actually having to read the whole Easter story. Because um, it took Mel Gibson about three hours to do the Passion of the Christ and I didn't think we had that long today. So, <laughs> so we're going to start uh, chapter 53 of Isaiah um, 2. For the servants of God grew up before him like a tender plant and like a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, royal, kingly pomp, that we should look at him. And no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected and forsaken by men. A man of sorrows and pains and acquainted with grief and sickness. And like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised. And we did not appreciate his worth or have any esteem for him. Surely he has borne our griefs, sicknesses, weaknesses and distresses, and carried our sorrows and pains of punishment. Yet we ignorantly considered him stricken, smitten, and afflicted by God, as if with leprosy. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our guilt and iniquities. The chastisement needful to obtain, peace and well-being for us was upon him, and with the stripes that wounded him, we are healed and made whole. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has made to light upon him the guilt and iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, yet when he was afflicted he was submissive and opened not his mouth, like a lamb is led to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who among them considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken to his death for the transgression of my people, to whom the stroke was due? And they assigned him a grave with the wicked, and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief and made him sick. When you, he make his life an offering for sin, and he has risen from the dead in time to come. He shall see his spiritual offspring, he shall prolong his days, and the will and pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Isaiah was written 746 years before Christ. Mm -hmm. 750 years before he actually went to the cross, the prophecy, and lots of other prophecies about him. They say the proven prophecy has 25 points. Studious and studied men say that for a prophecy to be given and to be actually proven that it's a true prophecy without what they call collusion, that's like someone trying to prove it. 25 points of that prophecy have to actually have happened. Because it's like winning the National Lottery then, it's like something like 7 billion to 1, it's like having somebody else's DNA. It's not going to happen. And in the Bible there's a number of things, there's, there's less than you think actually, there's about three Things about cities being destroyed and the rocks being made into a pathway and that pathway going. And there's a few that have happened over several hundred years. What always amazed me about the greatest story ever told, Christ's crucifixion, was that 25 prophecies and more were proven in a 24 hour period. Also, people say, ah, oh, yeah, but that's history. There is more evidence for the death and resurrection of Christ than there is for any other event yeah. in human history. Yeah. But why is Easter so important? You'll have all been to Easter services, some of you will have heard Easter services before, you'll have heard them at school, and some of you will have never heard the Easter story. It's important because in the beginning, as we've talked previously, Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, we had a blessed life, it was a relationship with God, God had come down, he'd share his life with us, and that's how we were designed, designed to be happy. And then Satan came along and tricked Adam and Eve into eating fruit from the tree of knowledge, and our relationship was separated. And we were, had finite lives, three score years and ten or thereabouts, and that was it, it's over. And then through Moses, God brought in the Ten Commandments. If we obey the law, we could then have a relationship with God again. And as laws tend to do, they tend to grow. And by the time we get to Christ's time, there are so many laws that the Pharisees have added that man have thought, oh, this is important as well. Like today, we've laws for parking, we've laws for how we raise our children. 
You've got laws for how hard you can smack them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to on that. I've always thought, you know, they said uh, there should be a man at the end of the street who's qualified in smacking, you know, legally appointed to do it. And you just go leave them up there one at a time. Like that. Go, man, he's got a license, he can do it. <laughs> but, <laughs> So we've got laws for everything, laws for you know, every single thing under the sun, and it's really, really confusing, and it's hard to obey them all, and although we say as good Christians that we obey them all, I'm sure we might have broken the odd traffic law, or I've had parking tickets, so none of us are innocent on that. And that was the problem. Nobody was innocent. So God said, right, well, he didn't just decide that day. Right from the beginning, as you can see, there has always been a bigger plan. A greater solution. Yeah. Jesus was going to come. And what used to happen is, is when you'd done something wrong and when you were guilty, you were, you were condemned to die. That, that's your human condition. It's not like, I've had, in the beginning when I first became a Christian, people used to say to me, oh, that's terrible, you know, the, the consequences of sin are death. And it's like, oh no, the consequences of the human condition are death. Yeah. That's, you know, it's not, it's not news to us. That's how it is. And so, to make sure that we had our place, we used to take our guilt and the things we've done wrong, and we take an innocent lamb, and it was called transference, and you put your hands on the lamb, and you say a prayer, and you transfer your guilt to the lamb, and then the lamb was sacrificed, and there God had the offering, and then we didn't die. And that's how they used to do it, you know, thousands of years ago. It wasn't that fair on the lamb, I know. So, Jesus came along, and we had the debt that we could not pay. And he did not owe a debt at all. So he paid the debt he did not owe. We owe the debt that we could not pay. He stood in for the Lamb. Have you heard the term the Lamb of God? And well, there is a term called the Lamb of God. And he stood for our sins and he died on the cross for us. And, and what was created in Adam and Eve was completed in Jesus Christ. I know we've said this before. And I remember when... <coughs> Going to the cross wasn't easy. It was hard. If you've seen the Passion of the Christ, the brutal whipping and beating and torture, spitting in his face, slapping him, carrying a huge wooden cross, all the way up to be having nails shoved through your hands, through your feet, sword in the side. It was just a horrific way to go. And it was painful. And I remember when I first took... Um, my niece to church, she brought, she was really sort of enthusiastic about bringing people, and she brought some people who I think were Methodists, training ministers. And they came to the church, <coughs> and they sat in this happy, clappy service. <laughs> and uh, afterwards, I went over to talk to them, and I said, did you have a nice time? And they went, oh, it was very joyful. And I said, yes, yes, it's brilliant. I said, it, it you know, really inspires you. He says, well, it wasn't very inspiring, Jesus going to the cross, was it? And I went, what do you mean? He says, well, that wasn't very joyful. And I, was, and I thought to myself, no, but that's not really the point. And the going to the cross wasn't easy. It was hard. Every year we watch World's Strongest Man, Christmas time. <laughs> or as my brother says, uh, world's how many steroids can you can take without your heart exploding? <laughs> <laughs> But uh, <laughs> we watch it every year, absolutely. And I remember one year, there was Zedritus Zavikis, excuse my pronunciation, or Big Z. And he came third that year and he was doing squats. And as he was doing these squats and he was under this huge pressure, right, blood started coming out the side of his skin by his eye. Mm. And the commentator went, that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> And the pressure and that he was under, the, the huge strain that he was under, and I was like, I was like, oh, that's not good. Later on, when I read, before Jesus went, and now remember, 750 years before, it was prophesied, Jesus knew where he was going and what he had to do. Right? So, before he went to do it, he went to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he went down on his knees, and he started praying. And he started praying, and he said, Lord, can you not take this bitter cup from me? Can you not stop this from happening? And he also said, he also said, but your will be done. Is there not another way? But your will be done. And it says that he prayed so hard that actually he sweated blood. Now I read the scripture before I saw it happen to Big Z. Mm -hmm. And I, I never, I thought, 
don't really get that. Why is he sweating with blood? And then I thought, no, the pressure that he was under, you suddenly realise that actually... Now, something that we sometimes don't get, I think Ted will get, that most battles are not fought in Christian circles on the battlefield. Most battles are fought and won on your knees. When Jesus went to the cross, he said nothing. He followed his path. It hurt. It was painful. And on the way there, he was committed. His battle was fought and won on his knees in the garden of Gethsemane. The intro with the Bible is all these really difficult pronunciations. <laughs> <laughs> and so he was sort of, so he's, he's on his way there. Now this is the, the thing. And going towards the cross and bringing himself up to that point, everything was building on him. And it was like that, that prayer in the garden sort of released something. Because I don't recall anything ever happening to Jesus before. I don't recall him being stoned or hurt or battered, ill, sick. Nothing. There's nothing. But from that point on, he was just absolutely crazily beaten and everything. And, it, and when he was on the cross and he actually died, he says, Father, why have you forsaken me? And I always thought that was a bit odd as well. So there's a couple of odd things going on. And it was like, whatever protection was on Jesus, whatever was looking after him, lifted off of him. And he goes all the way to that point. Now, it's one of those things in the Bible, we've got to be careful, because when it doesn't say that's the case, it's speculation. But I've always wondered whether or not he, he went there completely as a man. And the protection of the spirit was off of him. And that's why. And, and maybe he was sweating blood and he was under all that pressure. Because it wasn't anything to do with the crucifixion. And that was going to happen. Maybe. The feeling that he felt and all that pressure and all that stress. Was the fact that he was going to have to spend the next 24 hours without the Holy Spirit. Without God's relationship. I mean, that's a good thing. Sorry. The reason that he suffered in the Garden of Gethsemane. And sweat all that blood. Which apparently if you sweat one once here, of blood is the most painful thing you can ever imagine. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Apparently so, yeah. yeah. That's from a doctor, mm. I don't know. Yeah. Um, the reason is because he experienced all of our sin, all of our trials, yeah. all of our indiscretions. Yes. In that time. So everything we've ever been through, everything we will ever go through, every wrong that we do, mm. he suffered those things. So whenever you're praying and you think he doesn't understand, he does, because he has literally mm. suffered mm. in the Garden of Gethsemane for those things. The reason he said that he was forsaken, that God forsaken, mm. is because God left the presence of Jesus at that moment, mm. and God mm-hmm. forsaken. He later said, just before he died, that it is done, <sighs> and uh, yes, God yeah, came absolutely. Back to him and he gave his spirit. But up. that's what I'm saying. You've got to be when it comes to that scripture. There is interpretation of that, and when there is no clear crystal in the Word of God, that that's the interpretation. We're on shaky ground as to taking it literally. Now, I watched a guy sweat blood from his paws, lifting weights. And yes, he looked under great strain. But the most painful thing human beings can experience is actually the back nerve in the back of the head. And when that, that is the most painful part of the human body, when that actually is pressed up against something. There's lots of things, and we've got to be careful, and I know we all come from different backgrounds, and we come from different churches, and we come from different teaching, or from teaching at all. But the Word of God is the only guide we have to follow the Lord. And when the Lord says, in there, absolutely clear cut, that's the case, that's the case. When it doesn't say that, we only have man's opinion of it. And the Word of God is man's interpretation of God's will for this world. Jesus was God's interpretation. So we follow the man, and we have the word to guide us, but we've got to be careful about what we take in as absolutes and everything like that. We just, at that point, you are talking about speculation, unless it's absolutely crystal clear. Because it's really easy for someone a hundred years ago to write something down because he thought it, like C.S. Lewis said, I think the whole of the world and the universe too was created for no other reason than to lead people to Christ. But... <coughs> He's never experienced the universe. He wrote books, he was a very intelligent guy, but he was never out there. But, so, he's going to the cross, and he's going all the way up there. And the, <coughs> and the point is, again, all the way up to the cross, 
is that at that thing, we believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And so believing that Jesus died on the cross for our sins means that we are absolved of the sin and the iniquity that we faced before. And from that point on, we begin our new life. So we go up to that point and then we begin our new life from that point on. And the only thing we have past that point, past that decision, is our choice in Jesus. Anyone that has become a Christian knows that you have nothing else past that point. Everything else gets left behind. In the beginning of my life, before I became a Christian, you know, I had worry, I had anxiety, I was so stressed. And it felt a lot like Christ's walk in terms of, as I got closer to my decision with Christ, obviously I didn't know this decision with Christ was coming. I just felt that the pressure of life was building up on me. I felt that my mortgage was three months behind. The business I had was failing. I found that all these bills that I'd borrowed to build a business with were starting to sort of press in around me. And every day I had this list of people I had to ring to say that I couldn't pay them. And then I had family stress and another child on the way. And everything was building up on me. And to the point where I didn't sweat blood. But I developed ulcerated colitis. You know, the stress started bringing on a condition. And the doctor, I remember the doctor gave me medication. He says, congratulations, Mr. Barrington, your first lifetime medication. Mm-hmm. And I was so, and it was just, I just felt like hot. And I remember sitting with Alison in Falkirk and going, oh my, you know, I couldn't believe that. Because from going to a young man to being afflicted with something, it felt like that. And when I gave my life to Jesus, all those things I stripped off. They all, like a snake slipping its skin, I, I disappeared, they dissipated and they went to one side. And the only thing, and looking back, the only thing I have now is my choice in Jesus. Yeah. My health, my wealth, my life, my stress, my anxiety, everything else, I left at the cross. Yeah. Yeah. Where Jesus left his life at the cross. And from that point on, my eternal life began. I am living my eternal life. It has begun when I gave my life to Jesus. I have, I have begun it. It's the earthly part of it. And you've either begun it, or you're about to begin it, or you're just in that, that position of thinking about beginning it. Mm-hmm. But from, once you've chosen it, this is what happened. Jesus did not rise. He did not die on the cross and was risen. He was entombed. And he was put into a tomb. In a, an earthly tomb. As... And the only way you can describe it is like a caterpillar doesn't become a butterfly. It becomes a cocoon yeah. before it becomes a butterfly. And when I first, and I was talking to someone the other day, and they were saying, I've given my life, I've been baptised, I feel different, I feel different, I feel like a different person. I'm just, that bit that you were was talking about, about this new life and how I'm going to be blessed and things like that, that hasn't arrived yet, it hasn't, it hasn't become... And he's going through what you call tomb time. He's going through the part where he's not what he was and he's not what he's going to become. He's just sort of in the middle. And it does feel a little bit like that in the beginning. And you think, well, I can't go back and I can't go forward. And he's sort of in like a no man's land. And that's one of the... It's a difficult thing. So remember, if you ever find someone who has just become a Christian, it's, it's important that you understand or try and understand for them that they're in tomb time. Now, a butterfly is made of exactly the same DNA and components as a caterpillar. I am exactly the same person I was before I became a Christian. I'm exactly the same number of cells, blood, everything. Nothing has changed. But everything has changed. And so, a caterpillar lived on the earth and it munched leaves. A butterfly doesn't even know. It drinks. It's a completely different creature built of exactly the same components. And when I became a Christian, till how I now I remember because we lived in I was Scotland, found my faith in Scotland, and then came back to England. And when I came back, my parents and people I knew would say, "Oh, we're still waiting for the old Daniel to come back." I mean, and they're still waiting. I mean, <laughs> you know, he's somewhere. He's so <laughs> he's some crazy place. But, um, so they do, they, it's, they expect me to still be a caterpillar. And the reason, when I noticed that I'd come out of this tomb time, this time where actually, you know, I didn't think I'd moved on from where I was at. I, I was just sort of like, 
stationary. Um, it's when my old friend said, oh, you've moved back, Daniel. Why don't you come out for a drink with us? Why don't you come back to, you know, where you were before? And, and I would go, no, I don't really fancy it. You know, I'm going to go spend it with Alison and the kids, or I'm going to go to church, or I'm going to do something else. And it was like, they were coming back to ask me to go be a caterpillar, to go eat leaves with them. And you know what? I'm not, I wasn't a caterpillar anymore. I mean, I wanted to be with butterflies. I wanted to fly. You know, and it was... It's not being horrible to them, and you've got to be careful, you don't look back and go, oh, I'm not a caterpillar anymore, I'm over here. And it, it's just, the things that they wanted to do, I wasn't wanting to do those things, and I was a completely different creature. And remember that you're completely different creatures, you are eternal creatures, you want eternal things, kingdom things, heavenly things, you crave it and you earn it. And it's really important that you, that you understand. Now, if we go to Mark, 16, 1-7. It says, And when the Sabbath was passed, that is, after the sun had set, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome purchased sweet-smelling spices, so that they might go and anoint Jesus, his body. And very early on the first day of the week they came to the tomb, by then the sun had risen. And they said to one another, Who will roll back the stone for us out of the groove across the floor at the door of the tomb? And when they looked up distinctly, they saw that the stone was already rolled back, for it was very large. And going into the tomb, they saw a young man sitting there on the right side, clothed in a long, stately, sweeping robe of white. And they were utterly amazed and struck with terror. And he said to them, Do not be amazed and terrified. You who are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified, he has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But be going. Tell the disciples and Peter he goes before you into Galilee. You will see him there, just as he told you. So just like in Mark here, they went back and looked for Jesus in the earthly pain. They expected him to find him. They'd heard all his promises. They'd lived with him. They'd heard him say a thousand times that you know he will die and be risen on the third day. But they didn't grasp it. They didn't understand it. They didn't understand his eternal life had begun. And they went and looked back for him. The dead went to go look where the dead lay. But he was alive and he was risen from there. And once you've become that being and everything is left behind, and once you have just your choice in Jesus, the thing is, life will come and get you, and anxiety will come and get you, nervousness will come and get you, fear will come and get you. People will say things to you, people will say horrible things to you. You will feel bad. And you'll start to worry, and things like, say for instance, my um, financial situation changes, or, or something changes at work. Maybe my boss retires, and she's built this business, and then she goes and retires. And I think, what's going to happen? Or when the recession hit, I started to worry about whether or not I could, how's it going to affect my bills, and how was I going to get paid, and things like that. And, you know, say for instance, one, you become sick, or ill, or something happens. The earthly things go back, and so you go back to the tomb, and that feeling that you feel, because you've heard that, one of the things someone always says to me is, oh, do you know, it's really tough for people like you out there at the moment. Brilliant, that's just what I need to hear. <laughs> but, but they say it to me, and so I go rushing back to the tomb, and I start to go and try and find something that I used to wear. Fear, anxiety, worry. You know, feeling not worth anything. And I'll go pick up that dead thing that I left behind on the cross and I'll start putting it on like a suit. I'll go like that, go on, get that anxiety on. You know, oh, get that fear on up there. And for the next few days, I'm running around going, oh, do you know, and I just don't feel myself like I've got the weight of the cross on my back and I'm dragging this stuff around with me. And because it's like dead skin hanging on me. And it's just, you forget where it's come from, and you, but you do. I mean, from time to time, remember, don't go back to the tomb. I mean, what are you going back for? Ask yourself, what do I keep going back to the tomb for? And I guarantee you, we all do. We're going back to where we left it to try it on again, to see what it feels like. You know? Because that's what we're used to doing, carrying it around. We forget that we're a butterfly, and that we don't need to eat big caterpillar leaves. Another thing that tends to happen is when people become 
We've all been to churches, and we shouldn't really talk about other churches, and I'm not going to. But in some places you go, everything's amazing. Everything's brilliant, fantastic. You know, we don't discuss bad things that happen to you. We just say that God loves you, and he's awesome, and he's going to change your life. And it's going to be brilliant, it's going to be fantastic, and it's going to be amazing. And what a brilliant day we're going to have, and a brilliant week, and everything's going to be brilliant. And you get caught up, and you're brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. And inside, you're not feeling brilliant. But you're saying brilliant, 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 because everybody else is saying brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. And the Christianity, true Christianity, does not hide its face from pain. True Christianity, that I was saying to Ted when I arrived in, I spoke to someone the other day, and they went to help Mother Teresa in Calcutta when she was alive. And their job was to get people that were dying on the streets of Calcutta to bring them in to clean them so that they could die in dignity. You know? And I just thought, sounds like an absolute hellish job. But you've got... It doesn't hide its face from pain. And you see that the real true Christians like Mother Teresa and the people that are on missionary work are going out there and they're fronting it. I mean, working in areas like the Red Light area or in prisons. True Christianity. And no other faith in the world has it. Mind you, no other faith in the world has a saviour. I've said before that Muslims believe that we have our saviour in us. There is something in us that makes us want to go and face pain where it lives and say, hey, I'm bringing love to the pain. I'm not hiding away from it. I'm not sweeping it under the carpet. I'm not taking it away. Christianity doesn't hide its face from the pain. And I'll just read you something here. And this is going into John 20, 24 to 29. And it says, but Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples kept telling him, we have seen the Lord. And he said to them, unless I see in his hands the marks made by the nails, and I put my finger into the nail prints, and put my hand into his side, I will never believe it. Eight days later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, though they were behind closed doors, and stood among them and said, peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, reach out your finger here, and see my hands, and put your hand and place it in my side. Do not be faithless and incredulous, but stop your unbelief and believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, Thomas, do you now believe, trust, have faith? Blessed and happy and to be envied are those who have never seen me, and yet have believed and adhered to and trusted and relied on me. I've heard that scripture before said about having faith and not doubting, because he's called Doubting Thomas. There's a scripture about pain. Why is Jesus an eternal being? When people have said that they've seen Jesus and all these miracles they've said, and they've described a man with a smiling face with holes in his hands. Jesus walked out of the tomb and he still had the holes in his hands. Because Christianity doesn't hide its face from pain. We bear the marks of the painful existence we had before we gave our life to Jesus, before we slipped that skin and became an eternal being. Trevor last time talked about his testimony and he talked about the things that had happened to him in his life. He bears the marks of where he's been and those are the marks that help the future. For Jesus to have those marks in his hands and in his side, I mean, he doesn't need them. And you don't need them in heaven. But it's to remind us that he faced the pain of a human being. That he knows exactly what you're going through. He knows exactly where you're coming from. And he knows exactly how hard it is. Because he's been it, he's lived it, he's suffered. And he's died for our sins. And by believing in that, and realising that, you put it all to one side. And that minute you make that decision, and you come from that point, the only thing you have is Jesus. And everything else you leave at the cross. And it doesn't matter what life throws at you. And it will because we're still going through the earthly part of our eternal existence. But don't go back to the tomb. You don't need to put on the dead things that you've left behind. The hurts and the pains. What you do is you set your eyes on Jesus. And I've described it before. And it's two scriptures that throw us. Now one of the scriptures is Matthew 7.13. And the other scripture is just behind it. Matthew 11, 28, 30, but not even that far apart. 
Matthew 7.13 is about the narrow path, the narrow gate. The way to serve God is the narrow gate. And Matthew 11.28.30 is my yoke is easy. So you've got two contradictory scriptures, a couple of pages apart. One saying to serve God, it's really hard work. And the other one saying, oh, to serve Jesus, it's really easy. And this is how you describe it. The, we've talked about narrow path, let's take it even thinner. Let's take it to a tightrope. And you will walk in a tightrope. And there's times in your life when you're on the stand and you can see the tightrope in front and it goes to the other stand. And you put your eyes out in front and your hands out to the side and you walk one foot in front of the other. And life will make you look down. And walking a tightrope is hard. Really hard. And you look down and you realise how scary it is. Calvin's been climbing recently with Adam. And he says it's frightening when you look down. But what you don't realise when you're scared is that when Adam's got stood above him and holding a rope round him. So if he does fall, he's got him. And if you fall off that tightrope, if you take the decision not to stay on the narrow path, the God will catch you. He's behind you, to the left, to the right, above and below you. And he's always there. And you can't walk on a tightrope looking all the way around. Because you will fall. But if you set your eyes on Jesus and do the task that he asks you to do, one step at a time, you'll find that you'll get to the next platform. So yes, it's a difficult road and it's a difficult task, but by putting one foot in front of the other and doing what he asks you to do and setting your eyes on him, you carry nothing with you, no baggage, and you'll get to the other platform. And that's the essence of being a Christian. It will feel scary, because once you get to the platform, it doesn't stop, there's another rope. And your life will be made up of ropes and ropes and platforms and platforms. There will be more ropes than there are platforms. So you'll spend a lot of time. But you don't need to go backwards. You don't need any weight with you. You don't need to carry anything with you. As Jesus went from town to town, he said, take nothing with you, just my word. The only thing that we need is his promise. And our eyes set firmly on him. No weight of other scripture, no weight of anything other than what he teaches us to do. And remember, you aren't caterpillars. You are butterflies. You're made of all the same things that you were always made, but now you can fly. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that although this whole earth is different, and people come from different cultures, different places, different backgrounds, different learnings, that through it all we see your truth. I pray more than that, Lord, I pray that we are your truth. I pray that we recognise at this time, at Easter time, that we remember that we've snipped off the skin of who we were, we put down all the things that are dead and useless to us and we just choose you. We recognise that, Lord, this new life is scary, it can be frightening, it can feel like everywhere we step is fraught with danger. Help us keep our eyes fixed firmly on you. Help us to keep our inner hearts fixed firmly on you. Because there is no man or woman alive that can guide us. There is only you and your word. Help us to understand it. Help us to see clearly through the mist. Help us to be little Jesuses and little Christs here on this earth so we can help others. And help us to remember, Lord, that we are butterflies and we are not caterpillars anymore. And we don't need caterpillar things. We just need you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.